One of President Trump's nominees who served in Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee's administration picks up the evidentiary trail on the Clinton Foundation. Nobody ever got anything from the State Department because they supported the Clinton Foundation. What it means now that a prosecutor is actually investigating allegations of corruption by America's first couple. Will the outcome be different than it was under former FBI Director James Comey? Sham investigation. And fact-checking Michael Wolff's fire and fury. What's true? What's false? We'll investigate. Plus, an Arkansas woman takes off after winning big from a lottery ticket, but her co-worker claims they were supposed to split the jackpot. We'll take up the case in Night Force. Hello and welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. New tonight, there are now reportedly at least four official inquiries involving former presidential candidate and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. The Justice Department is deciding if a special counsel might be needed on the sale of U.S. uranium mining assets to Russia. Hillary Clinton's State Department was one of nine agencies that signed off on the deal. There's also a potential probe into a report you've seen right here on Fox News at Night. Allegations the Obama administration slow rolled or even stopped a DEA investigation into millions of dollars in Hezbollah drug and weapons trafficking. So it didn't interfere with diplomatic efforts on the Iran nuclear deal. Clinton was Secretary of State during the Obama administration. Last night we spoke exclusively to the DEA agent in charge at the time. Very strange for me sitting there listening to the Attorney General of the United States directing his people to have a meeting to get more information from the DEA and our interagency partners about this global trade based money laundering scheme, and they weren't interested. It never happened. And I can't explain it. Meanwhile, Little Rock's new U.S. Attorney Cody Highland has already reportedly interviewed a key witness dealing with donations to the Clinton Foundation. Highland was appointed by President Trump, and he used to work for Republican Governor Mike Huckabee. Highland and the DOJ examining whether the Clinton Foundation traded money for political favors while Clinton was Secretary of State. Huckabee telling us tonight he expects Highland to pursue this case aggressively. He says, quote, if he found evidence that I had violated the law, he would come after me regardless of his loyalty to me because he is loyal to the law and what's right. That is certainly different than the former FBI director James Comey approach was to make political decisions and not legal ones. End quote. Finally, the DOJ is exploring whether to reopen the probe into Hillary Clinton's private email server and classified emails she stored there. The Clintons claim these are all efforts by the Trump administration to divert attention from Robert Mueller's special counsel. Well, Sarah Westwood is the White House correspondent for the Washington Examiner, joins us now to break this down. Good to have you with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Okay, so, goodness, there's a lot to do here. Um, let's start, first of all, Senators Grassley and Graham have sent a letter um, to DOJ officials, and they say that they want to know uh, a lot more about Christopher Steele, the man who is at the center of the dirty dossier. This is what uh, Dianne Feinstein, who's the ranking Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee, has to say. She says, clearly, it's another effort to deflect attention from what should be the committee's top priority, determining whether there was collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia to influence the election and whether there was subsequent obstruction of justice. So let's start with that piece of the puzzle first. Do you think we go anywhere with that? Well, certainly there's been a lot of attention to not just the contents of the dossier, but how it may have been weaponized during the campaign. Remember, this was a dossier that was funded in part by the DNC and by Hillary Clinton's own campaign for president, uh, funded through a firm that has not been forthcoming with congressional investigators. They pleaded their Fifth Amendment rights when they appeared before the committees. Christopher Steele now, according to Senators Grassley and Graham, potentially was not forthcoming when he talked about the dissemination of the contents of the dossier, how he provided it to reporters. And that's a really key question because we still don't know to what extent the dossier was used to open this FBI investigation. So this is uh, the first criminal investigation we're seeing out of the congressional Russia probes. It'll be interesting to see where it goes, if anywhere. Yeah, and they say basically there are inconsistencies in what he had to say um, and that they maybe can be explained away, but I think it was Grassley said he didn't think that, that was likely. So he's asking questions on that front. That's unfolding at the same time there's now this probe into the Clinton Foundation that we talked about, um, the investigation of pay-to-play uh, allegations. Um, and we talked about the U.S. attorney there, Cody Highland, mm -hmm. uh, and what he's digging into. Arkansas is a very interesting place, and some of these blood feuds go back a long way involving the Clintons. Um, some are saying, listen, he's a Trump appointee um, and that this is partisan in nature. What do you think? Well, certainly that claim is bolstered by the fact that President Trump has personally called 
for the investigation of Hillary Clinton since before the campaign. It's something he sort of backed away from right after the election, but as the Mueller probe has heated up, he's returned to this call for the Justice Department to open these investigations into Hillary Clinton. And remember, though, that this was a case that was opened during the Obama presidency. It had, off, it had arms that were being investigated in Arkansas and in New York, and eventually that investigation was consolidated in Washington because the Justice Department didn't want to take aggressive investigative steps in the middle of an election year. So this isn't something that's totally being driven by the Trump administration. There were legitimate allegations uh, that came up during the campaign that were potentially not fully explored, but certainly President Trump undercuts the credibility of that probe when he himself is inserting himself into the debate about the Clinton Foundation. Well, here's what the Clinton Communications Director, Nick Merrill, has to say about this. He says, let's call this what it is, a sham. The goal is to distract from the indictments, guilty pleas, and accusations of treason from Trump's own people at the expense of our justice system's integrity. It sounds a lot like what we heard from Senator Feinstein about the Republicans demanding information about Christopher Steele. In each case, they're saying, here, this is just a distraction. What this is really about is Trump and inclusion and Russia. Um, and these investigations are just, there's not, they're not legitimate. They're just a distraction. That's a pretty typical defense from any party when there's politics involved in an investigation. It's interesting because you may start seeing people citing the political allegiances of the attorney in Arkansas when trying to undermine the Clinton Foundation probe. That's the same thing Republicans are trying to do with the Mueller probe, pointing to Peter Strzok, pointing to Bruce Orr, people who were involved in uh, the Russia and allegate the Russian collusion probe, uh, who potentially have allegiances to the Democratic Party. So this is something Thing that both sides are trying to do is, is look at who's involved in the investigations and, and where do their political biases lie. Yeah, we talked a little bit about uh, Governor, former Governor Huckabee said that, you know, they worked together. I think Highland worked in his administration. They go way back. Um, and he said this. He says, if I were innocent, I'd not be worried at all if he investigated me, Cody Highland. If I were guilty, I'd be scared to death. He went on to say, listen, even though I helped him start out in his career and we have this long history together, I have no doubt that if I had done something wrong, Cody Highland would come after me. And that's going to be, he says, very different than what we saw with James Comey. That's sort of the same argument that defenders of Mueller are trying to use, too, that, well, maybe there are Democratic donors on the team. Maybe there are people who were texting about how much they hate Trump and how much they love Hillary, but they're still straight shooters. And that argument, you know, there, there's a certain amount of merit to it. People are allowed to have political opinions. But it does raise just fundamental questions about the integrity of any investigation when the people leading it uh, have a potential ax to grind about their subjects. And it's why there is a lot of effort, or there should be, to keep the Justice Department apolitical. You have covered Clintons, the Clintons, the Clinton scandals for a long time. They seem to have gotten wriggled free of most any serious accusations over decades of complaints against them. Um, folks could say that's because they're innocent. These were all sham investigations. How do you think they're feeling tonight with these renewals on numerous fronts? Do you think that they're sitting there thinking, listen, we've been cleared before, we're going to be fine? Or do you think there's ever any real fear with the Clintons that some of this could be to their detriment? Well, certainly, I think the Clintons are probably hoping that this has all been litigated before in the court of public opinion. There were a lot of people who thought there was no there there with the emails. There were a lot of people who thought that she skated free on mishandling classified information that the Justice Department used kid gloves in that investigation. So I think a public opinion is probably pretty set. Uh, people believe what they believe about the cases at this point because they've been in the public eye for so long. And uh, there are people who think that the Clintons, uh, certainly there's been so much smoke surrounding them for so long that there must have been many fires. There are others who think that they've just their whole lives have been victims of the vast right-wing conspiracy. And that view is so set with people that mm -hmm. it's hard to see these investigations changing folks' mind, uh, barring some bombshell. Yeah. Well, we'll see what investigators come up with and what they do to ultimately decide to pursue. Sarah, great to see you. Good to see you. Have a great weekend. You too. All right. Conservative watchdog group Judicial Watch is praising the Justice Department's decision to look at the Clinton Foundation, saying the previous investigation was, in their words, a farce. So the Justice Department asking questions is, is the least that can be done, given the outrageous sham investigation that took place last year. There's going to be another pretend investigation uh, that is designed to mollify critics like the President and Judicial Watch. Joining me now from Judicial Watch is Chris Farrell, the Director of Investigations and Research. Chris, great to see you again. Hey, Sharon. 
Okay, so what do you make of this uh, restarting of the foundation investigation? Because we know, as Sarah said, that some of these things have gone on for years. Um, in part, the Washington Post says this, the FBI has been investigating the Clinton Foundation for months, this newest track, it sounds like, reviving a probe that was dialed back during the 2016 campaign amid tensions between Justice Department prosecutors and FBI agents about the politically charged case. I mean, Chris, in your estimation, aren't many of those same people still going to be there? They are, but the important thing to realize is that uh, through our litigation, we've uncovered records and documents that demonstrate that there's absolutely no daylight between the Clinton Foundation and Secretary of State Clinton while she was serving in office. And for example, there's one particular email from Doug Band, who is a Clinton Foundation official, communicating with Huma Abedin, where he says, hey, uh, the Crown Prince of Bahrain has exercised all the normal channels and he can't get a meeting with the secretary, meaning Secretary Clinton. And uh, Doug Band says to Huma Abedin, uh, we need to, he's a high dollar donor, so we need to put him in contact with the secretary. So here's a, a Clinton Foundation official acknowledging that the routine normal channels have failed, that this guy's a high dollar donor, and they have to get him special access to the secretary. I mean, this, in, in black and white, in their emails communicating internally with each other, it demonstrates that extra privilege, that extra access, this pay to play mentality. Uh, you know, this is produced to us through our litigation, and it's just one example of literally hundreds of others. Well, do you think that this will have a different result, though? Because a lot of folks will say, Listen, the Clintons are sophisticated. Some of this information was out there before. Nothing happened. A lot of the same actors are still there plugged into the DOJ, to the FBI. Uh, and this isn't going to be that different from what Jim Comey turned up. You know, that's what they rely upon, frankly, is a certain degree of fatigue and exhaustion from the public. Uh, and having, you know, their spokesman go out and say, oh, not this again. The problem is that at this point, we have actual documents. We have people that we've taken depositions of, like Huma Abedin and Cheryl Mills and others, uh, where you know the case is not good. It looks rough. The, the sad thing is that it was up to Judicial Watch, literally for years, to uncover the stuff and to press the case. And based on the foundation that we've already laid, now the Justice Department, with a fresh set of eyes, is really obligated to go forward and uh, and conduct a legitimate investigation. You know, when you have a subject interview of Mrs. Clinton on the 2nd of July last year, and she isn't Mirandized, and it's not under oath, and there's no transcript, no other federal government employee or any government employee, period, in her position would ever be treated that way. And I say that because I'm a former special agent of Army Counterintelligence. I've done national security crime investigations and successfully had people jailed for a tiny fraction of what Mrs. Clinton has done. Yeah. And uh, investigation 101 is when you say I don't recall 39 times in one interview, you pause and you pull out her non-disclosure agreement that she signed and you show it to her and say, now, does this refresh your recollection? Let's move forward to the questions. How is it that you can say you don't recall? And none of this was done. So, you know, it, it was in, in several instances a sham investigation and it's critical that now that a fresh set of eyes can look at it and all this documentary evidence that we've produced through our litigation is in the public record for there to be a legitimate fresh look. Yeah, and, and uh, speaking of another fresh look, I just want to quickly note um, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, also sent out another letter this week saying he wants an investigation to James Co Comey's disclosure of the memos that led to the reporting in the New York Times. Uh, he sent out a letter and he says this, uh, asking the DOJ, uh, the FBI, have you initiated an investigation into the matter of whether Mr. Comey improperly disclosed classified information by providing these memoranda to Professor Richmond? That's the one who then leaked the information to the media. If so, what's the status of the investigation? If not, why not? Um, just very quickly, do you think that goes anywhere? Uh, it will, because uh, former Director Comey is a leaker. He took classified information and knowingly and willingly passed it on to a cutout to get it published in the New York Times. Uh, his work product, he absconded with federal government records and then unlawfully leaked them. He's, I mean, in my opinion, he is a prime suspect for prosecution under 18 U.S.C. 793F, which is mishandling of national classified information. 
And uh, I don't know how he walks away from that. His testimony on the 8th of June in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee, when he finished his testimony, he should have been Mirandized as he walked out the door. Because he admitted to doing just that, passing on classified information. Well, it's and, outrageous. And the Attorney General has vowed that he's going to crack down on those leaks, so a lot of people want to see that happen in this case. So we'll see if it does. Chris Farrell, thank you very much for thank dropping you, in. Shannon. And by the way, we just got this picture in from the White House showing President Trump chatting with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and others at Camp David. Check it out. You can see House Speaker Paul Ryan engaged in conversation there next to the president. This is being billed as a legislative dinner, and they're looking ahead to what's next, meeting at Camp David after three big moves by the president this week. Red meat for conservatives, anathema to the left, tightening up marijuana laws, opening new waters for oil and gas drilling, and suspending aid to Pakistan. We're sure they're talking about that and much more. What's next? Let us know what you think. Tweet me at Shannon Bream to see. What do you think they're talking about at Camp David this weekend? Oh, to be a fly on the wall. Well, American business is booming, and fewer Americans are on food stamps. Plus, unemployment among African Americans hits a record low. A debate on why you may not be hearing about all the good economic news. And more fallout from Michael Wolff's controversial book claims that, quote, 100% of the people around the president are worried about his mental state. Pastor Robert Jeffress spends a lot of time with the president and first lady. He joins us to address the allegations next. Accurate insider account of the Trump White House or gossip driven drivel that mangles the truth. Those are the competing narratives as fire and fury. The new book about the president and his top aides hits bookstores today. The White House tonight pushing back hard against the author and his alleged access inside the West Wing. Somebody who actually does have access there. Peter Ducey joins us <laughs> with the very latest. Good to see you tonight. And Shannon, Michael Wolf may need to check his math because today again he insisted that 100% of people around President Trump are questioning the commander in chief's mental capabilities. But that percentage appears to be shrinking because the people who are actually around the president say that Michael Wolff is wrong. Like Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, who told CNN this morning he's never had a reason to question the president's mental fitness. We've also got a new denial tonight from the famous Democrat who Wolf writes was lobbying the new Republican president to win the ambassadorship to the UK. Vogue editor Anna Wintour, Winter's rep, is quoted today as saying that story is preposterous. Somebody already living across the pond, Tony Blair, is also accusing Wolf of making up a story about him, which describes the former British Prime Minister of warning Jared Kushner that Trump was being spied on by the Brits. And tonight on Twitter, we are also now hearing from one of the print reporters whose name is featured in Fire and Fury, Mark Berman, who posted this, quote, Spotted in the new Michael Wolf book about Trump, A Four Seasons Breakfast, featuring Washington Post national reporter Mark Berman. I have never had breakfast at the Four Seasons, never actually been there, but now I wonder if I can use this to go eat there and expense it. Berman says Wolf probably meant a lobbyist with the same name and that he actually couldn't have been there at that breakfast because he was attending the birth of his child that day. Wolf has been selling a lot of books, but uh, they all have an author's note that outlines that he knows some of the info he got was, quote, baldly untrue, but he says that he published what he believes to be true and Wolf did invite a lot of new scrutiny this morning when he admitted on the Today Show he said whatever he thought he needed to say to gain access to the White House. So the next question is what exactly did he say and did it create a false pretense? Shannon. Well I just think it's so interesting. I, I can't recall another big inflammatory book like this with a note like that in the very beginning that says uh, some of this information I got may not actually be true. I actually got conflicting stories about some of these things that I'm going to put in the book, so I just chose my version of it. Right, and I read most of the book tonight. We have a copy we here do. at the Bureau that everybody's been fighting over. I, there is no mention. He does not flag which passages are from the people that he says he knows were lying. He's it's just a little note at the he's beginning. He's going to sell a lot of books, but that note, if you and I try to put that in our... Up, upcoming features of um, best-selling books. I don't know if it's going to work. Mine's a picture book, so I don't know. If, uh, <laughs> that, that's Keep necessary. working on it. And we'll feature it right here on Fox News tonight. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jamie. All right, Michael Wolff also making some stunning claims about those closest to the president, including his own family, questioning Mr. Trump's mental fitness. According to your reporting, everyone around the president 
senior advisors, family members, every single one of them questions his intelligence and fitness for office. Let me, let me put, a, put a, a marker in the, in the sand here. 100% of the people around him. The one description that, that everyone gave, everyone has in common, they all say he is like a child. They say he's um, a, a moron, an idiot. Wow. All right. But my next guest disputes that statement, having spent a lot of time from the days of the campaign all the way through just days ago with the president and the first lady. Pastor Robert Jeffress is senior pastor at First Baptist Church in Dallas and a Fox News contributor. Pastor, great to have you with us tonight. Thanks, Shannon. All right. I want to give you a couple specific things to respond to. First of all, um, we have this uh, recollection about the first lady on the night of the election. Shortly after 8 p.m. on election night, he writes, when the unexpected trend Trump might actually win seemed confirmed, Don Jr. told a friend that his father, or DJT as he calls him, looked as if he had seen a ghost. Melania was in tears and not of joy. Your response? Well, I happened to be in Trump Tower on Election Day, and I got to spend some time with President and Mrs. Trump, and uh, they were relaxed. They were optimistic about the future. Nobody was crying, I can assure you. And Shannon, admittedly, I didn't spend all day with the Trumps. I didn't spend most of the day with the Trump with the Trumps, but I spent more time with the Trumps than Michael Wolf did, and I can tell you that is just an inaccurate portrayal. Is it your sense that either one of them did or didn't expect him to win or did or didn't want him to win? Did you ever hear the first lady, uh, you know, because there are these intimations that she didn't want to give up her life, that she didn't want him to win, to run, any no. of that? No, I, I never heard any of that, and certainly not from President Trump. He said over and over again that if he didn't win, this whole exercise was absolutely futile. And so it's a completely fictitious notion, the idea that he did not want to win. And Shannon, here's the overall problem with this book. Michael Wolf uh, claims to have spent a grand total of three hours with President Trump over 18 months writing this book. I've spent more time than that just a few weeks ago with him over a two-day period of time. I was with him in the Oval Office. I stood next to him at several public events. I was with him and the First Lady twice in the upstairs residence. I saw him more energized, more focused on his agenda than in the two years that I have known him. In fact, in the Oval Office, he recalled with great detail the nuance of a brief conversation from two years ago. I was so amazed, I said to one of his staff members, he doesn't forget a thing, does he? And they said, no, he doesn't. So this picture of an incoherent president who doesn't recognize people and is constantly repeating himself, that may be appealing to President Trump's enemies, but it has no basis in reality. Okay, with that in mind, I want to play a little bit of a soundbite from uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin uh, talking about this meeting that a number of lawmakers had with a psychiatrist who said essentially, <laughs> he's falling apart, we're watching it happen. Uh, here's uh, Representative Raskin. I think she spoke for a lot of people in the mental health community in telling us that there are growing signs of paranoia, delusion, and isolation in the president's behavior, and uh, any hope that we had that it might turn around or get better uh, was dashed by the discussion. Okay, paranoia, delusion, and isolation. Uh, she said that he was falling apart. Wolf says 100% of the people around him think that he's got mental fitness issues. Uh, does that line up with the man that you're spending time with? <laughs> no, it doesn't at all. Now look, Shannon, if there is a kernel of truth in this book, it is the charge that President Trump is not, quote, normal. He isn't normal, which is why the American people put him in office to begin with. The American people were tired of a normal that said we ought to accept subpar economic growth, that we ought to accept ISIS as a continuing reality, that our best days were behind us. This president said no to that kind of normal, and I think more and more Americans are grateful that the president isn't, quote, normal, and has established a new normal for America. That's what's going on here. It is is a different day here in Washington. Pastor Jeffress, yeah. always great to chat with you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Shannon. All right, and the loser is how a Hollywood awards show will cope with the Me Too controversy sweeping the industry and implicating yet another major player in the industry. And a bellicose birthday boy ready to sit down and talk. 
Could tensions on the North Korean peninsula soon begin easing, or is it all a scam? And fear on the streets after a woman is stabbed 14 times just blocks away from Little Mogadishu in Minneapolis. Her attacker remains a fugitive, and frightened residents want to know why it appears nothing is being done. That story right up to the break. Another claim tonight of sexual misconduct uh, and assault against a film industry power player comes ahead of a major award show this weekend, the first of the season. Threatens to be overshadowed now by the storm of allegations that has toppled actors, producers, and screenwriters across the industry. Trace Gallagher in Los Angeles with the late breaking details. Hi, Trace. Hi, Shannon. Let's begin with the latest allegations. Four women have now accused Oscar-winning director Paul Haggis of sexual misconduct. Haggis, best known for directing Crash and Million Dollar Baby, is being accused by publicist Holly Breast of rape. Breest says after a film premiere in 2013, Haggis lured her to his apartment and sexually assaulted her. Haggis denies the allegations and has now sued Breest for extortion, claiming she wanted $9 million to settle the claim or she threatened to go public. The three other accusers have chosen to remain anonymous. And this weekend on the red carpet, you will see a plethora of black as the Me Too movement meets the Time's Up campaign, which has called on women to wear black at the Golden Globes to support the fight against sexual harassment. Nominees Gal Gadot, Mary J. Blige, and Holly Hunter have all vowed to wear black, and hundreds of others are expected to follow suit, though some women believe the blackout is dumbing down the debate and think women should instead celebrate their newfound power by wearing a variety of bright colors. And whatever the fashion, there is likely to be some sniping. Actress Rose McGowan has already criticized Globe nominee Meryl Streep for remaining silent about Harvey Weinstein. Streep maintains that she did not know. And amid the back and forth, literary critic Daphne Merkin wrote an op-ed in the New York Times titled, Publicly We Say Me Too, Privately We Have Misgivings, where she writes, quoting, Privately, I suspect many of us, including many long-standing feminists, will be rolling our eyes, having had it with the reflexive and unnuanced sense of outrage that has accompanied this cause from its inception, turning a bona fide movement of moral accountability into a series of ad hoc and sometimes unproven accusations. Finally, it'll be interesting to see how host Seth Meyers traverses the Golden Globes landscape, because as a rule, you would expect funny this year. The rules may not apply. Shannon. Hmm. A lot of eyes will be watching to see exactly how they handle this in this first big award show of the season. Uh, Trace, thank you very much. Sure. Well, on July 1st, 2015, Kate Steinle was shot and killed on a pier in San Francisco. A little more than a month ago, an illegal immigrant, Jose Garcia Zarate, was acquitted of not only first and second degree murder, but also involuntary manslaughter, claiming he just found the gun seconds before he accidentally fired the bullet that killed Steinle. Zarate was convicted of felony gun possession and had a sentencing hearing today. Our Claudia Cowan was there. Shannon, as expected, Jose Garcia Zarate was sentenced to time served for his conviction on felony gun possession, and the judge denied his request for a new trial. But now his case moves to federal court, where we could see some fireworks with his new lawyer promising to take on the president and other members of the Trump administration. A federal grand jury indicted Garcia Zarate on new weapons and immigration charges just days after he was acquitted in state court of murder and assault in the fatal shooting of Kate Steinle in 2015. The president taking to Twitter that night, calling the verdict disgraceful, and within days, a federal grand jury handed down the indictment. Famed civil rights attorney Tony Serra blasted the indictment as politically motivated. He says it's highly unusual for the feds to file such charges against someone who has no record of gun violence or gang affiliation. He says there are also double jeopardy concerns and that he'll move to have the case thrown out. This is retaliatory. Therefore, there's going to be a motion made right at the beginning for dismissal predicated on vindictive prosecution, which is disallowed under federal and state law. This is a case that ultimately will be summed up, that a vote for guilty in the federal case is a vote for Trump. 
Garcia Zarate will now be turned over to U.S. Marshals and will be housed across the bay in Alameda County while the legal proceedings against him continue here in San Francisco. He'll be arraigned in federal court early next week and, if convicted, could face up to 10 years in federal prison before he is eventually deported for the sixth time. Shannon? Six times. All right, Claudia Cowan, thank you very much. Morgan Evanson was walking home from work in uptown Minneapolis when she was tackled from behind. She says her body went numb as she was stabbed 14 times. Her cries for help alerted a passerby who scared the attacker away. This was three weeks ago. Now, police say they're looking for this person, a description. A Somali suspect in his early 20s, about 5 foot 7, uh, slender build and short hair with a slight Afro style on top. No word yet on a motive. But according to USA Today, uh, Minnesota is one of the top states for ISIS-inspired terror attacks since 2014. And contacted via FaceTime by local reporters, Evanson is now wondering about her attacker's motive. This person who did this to me, who for no reason, is still out there. And I don't know if he's looking to do this to somebody else, if it was a one-time thing. Was it because I'm a woman? Was it because of the color of my skin? Was it what I was wearing? Was it the purse that I had on my shoulder, even though you didn't take anything from me. Area residents say they're actually scared to go out at night. Anyone with information about that case is urged to contact Minneapolis police at 612-692-TIPS. We are learning new details tonight about Las Vegas shooter Stephen Paddock. The Las Vegas Review Journal reporting staff at the Mandalay Bay Hotel had more than 10 interactions with him in the days leading up to the October 1st massacre. A spokesperson from Mandalay Bay says nothing led them to believe that anything was out of the ordinary. Quote, there were numerous interactions with Stephen Paddock every day at the resort, including a room service delivery and a call with housekeeping on October 1st, all of which were normal in nature. Well, Paddock killed 58 people that night. And as you recall, the hotel itself has been criticized for its emergency response plans. It's being sued for allegedly not calling police right away, among other things. Kim Jong-un reportedly turns 34 on Monday. Kind of hard to know, but the occasion may not be celebrated in North Korea. According to reports, New Year's calendars printed by the country's foreign language publishing house have omitted his birthday. His father, previous Supreme Leader Kim Jong-II's birthday, is celebrated in the country February 16th. Now, the only known occasion of Kim Jong-un's birthday being publicly honored is when Dennis Rodman sang him happy birthday during a 2014 basketball game. Amidst the fire and fury here in Washington, D.C., the economy is actually booming. We'll bring you the encouraging numbers and talk about why you may not be hearing about them. And later on, when night court convenes, a waitress in Arkansas claims her co-worker took off with her half of their lottery winning. So she is taking legal action. Our legal eagles fill you in on the details. Coming up. Amidst the fire and the fury of Washington, D.C. right now, you may have missed some good economic news. President Trump tweeting Dow goes from 18,589 on November 9th, 2016, to 25,075 today for a new all-time record. Jumped 1,000 points in the last five weeks, record fastest 1,000-point move in history. And another significant number, the black unemployment rate falls to a record low, 6.8 percent. That is the lowest rate since the Bureau of Labor Statistics started tracking the data 45 years ago. Joining me now to talk about it, Vince Colonnese, editorial director of The Daily Caller, and Capri Cafaro. She is the former Ohio State Senate majority, excuse me, minority leader. <laughs> I give you promotion. Thanks. And the current executive in residence at American University. Thanks for joining us tonight, you guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, so Vince, those sound like good numbers. Yes. But we just have a tweet from the president. He's not talking about that tonight. No. Let's talk about what he is talking about tonight. Hold on a minute. I have to pull it up here. He <laughs> is talking about the book again. He says, Michael Wolf is a total loser who made up stories in order to sell this really boring and untruthful book. He used sloppy Steve Bannon, who cried when he got fired and begged for his job. Now sloppy Steve has been dumped like a dog by almost everyone to it. I happen to like my dog, by the way, but apparently yeah. in this case, the president of Mizuno is positive. But as long as we're talking about that, we're not talking about the economy. Right. Yeah. Cried. Oh, I cried when he got fired. That's a rough one. I, 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 I also cried when I got fired. Uh, OK. All right. Well, you're not Steve Bannon. I, I, but, <laughs> I, sloppy Steve. But sloppy <laughs> Steve. Yeah. Uh, sloppy Shannon, I guess, works. Um, all right. But back to the point. The idea here is that I think it's important to realize, like, yes, we get distracted by the fights in D.C. The media often does at large. The mainstream press definitely. Um, but that distraction very much does a disservice to all of the good things that are going mm -hmm. on in the country to include 
uh, tax reform. I mean, more people are going to have more money in their pocket this year. The economy is, is, is heading in a great direction. Black unemployment at its lowest rate. Fewer people on, on, uh, on food stamps. Um, ISIS dying. I mean, all sorts of things that you want to be happening. Mm -hmm. We are, by every measure, better off than we were one year ago right now. And I think that's what the president should be talking about, by and large. And that's what the press should be talking about. Well, surprisingly enough, this was surprising to some people. Uh, this is the headline in the Washington Post. Trump's first year jobs numbers were very, comma, very good. Now, Capri, they don't love a whole lot of what he does. True this. But that's a very positive headline. Hey, well, you can't be fake news all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday night. We in have to case, have a little bit of levity, In the right? case of here, never times. We're never doing fake news. We're never doing fake news. And look, I mean, there's no question that there is an undeniable, uh, you know, upward trend, positive trend in the economy, whether it comes to the issue of jobs, with the jobs numbers that just came out, the stock market, et cetera. But, you know, we also have to look a little bit uh, deeper past the numbers that are out there right now. And not only are we not talking about the positive aspects in the press, um, but frankly, Democrats that do have, you know, some arguments to make that, uh, frankly, some of the uh, successes of Wall Street are not necessarily coming down the Main Street, we're not talking about that meat either. Well, African American unemployment is the lowest in 45 years. At the same time, uh, adjusted for inflation, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, African American wages are actually $1,800 lo uh, lower than they were in 2000. 50% of America's rural community that are old enough to, to work do not have jobs. One in three are in poverty. These are real. Um, and while obviously there is a, uh, a positive trend, there's still a lot of America that's being left behind. And we need to focus on those policy solutions rather than running around with our hair on fire for well, every salacious thing that comes out. Well, and, and, and even to the positive things, as the Washington Post gave credit to the president, uh, a Slate columnist says this, yeah, they're good, but it's not about Trump. He says, but <laughs> as of now, there is just no sign that Trump has delivered any kind of dramatic change. Donald Trump inherited a pretty good economy. Unlike the rest of his presidency, he's managed not to muck it up. No. And I pronounce mm. that very carefully, Vince. It's incredible stuff. I mean, look, the Dow hitting this week, 25,000, that happened thanks in large part to Donald Trump because of the optimism, I think, the anticipation of that tax reform mm -hmm. package that corporate America felt like that they were going to get a better, a better uh, tax rate. And as a result, they did. And that came through. And that's really helped the markets. I think Trump can claim a lot of credit for this. We often overestimate how much polit any given politician is involved in the economy. I think that's a sin of media. Uh, but yeah. in this case, I think he does deserve credit when it comes to how um, robust the market is right now. And they're not under the impression, by the way, that more government regulations on the way, that there are going to be more liabilities that are created by the government. Uh, and that's because Donald Trump is president of the United States. That's right. true. Quick that follow is word, true. Capri. No, I think there's no question about that. I think that, you know, the uh, executive action that President Trump has taken in regards to regulatory reform and reducing those burdens, in addition to, you know, a, a, uh, a late breaking uh, success uh, legislatively with, with tax reform, uh, I think, you know, certainly he does deserve credit in the Republican Congress deserves credit for those things. Um, but again, it's, uh, I think it's about that shared success that we haven't seen entirely yet. And more work to be done. More, always There's more work always to be done. There's always more work always. to be done here And together, Democrats and Republicans. Come on, people. Hey, 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 make it happen. <laughs> if only, right. if only. All right, Capri and Vince, great to see you both <laughs> Absolutely. Nice to see you. All right, enough already. Winter's chill brings misery to many, but some are trying to find a way to have some fun in the flakes. We're going to show you that. And here's something to warm the heart and uh, possibly the pocketbook. Lottery fever is heating up. Get your tickets. Time now for Night Court. It is fairly common in a lot of offices for coworkers to form an office pool for things like big lottery tickets. But what happens when one coworker hits the jackpot? and takes off and runs without sharing the winnings. Well, that is the subject of tonight's night court case. Leslie Underwood has filed suit against her coworker, Mandy Van Houten, after she ran off with $300,000 that she won from the Arkansas State Lottery. Underwood claims her boss gave the two of them several scratch off tickets before Christmas with the understanding that whatever they would win, the two would split. So she's now asking a judge to put the winnings in a court supervised account until it's determined whether or not she's entitled to what she claims is her half of this. Here's what Underwood had to say. It's kind of like somebody died for somebody to tell you that they don't think that you deserve it. All right, let's bring in our legal eagles to talk about it. Nick Fortuna is a trial and appellate attorney, and Mercedes Colwin is a criminal defense attorney and Fox News legal analyst. Great to see you both. 
Hi, Shannon. How are you? Okay, Thank so you. my understanding is that they got these tickets. The boss said, hey, I just bought a bunch of scratch-off tickets. The two of them were waitresses together. They were good friends. They sat down and scratched them off. The one who got the ticket that was $300,000, um, you know, apparently they talked about what they were going to do. Here is what uh, the woman who's filed the lawsuit says they discussed. We talked about how life-changing it would be and what we were going to do with this money. She even talked about giving back because it was such a blessing. All right, so instead of that, Leslie apparently says that Mandy shows up then with a the big, huge, giant fake check that you've won the lottery. And that's how she found out her friend was taking the whole $300,000. Nick, who's in the right here? Well, certainly Miss Underwood is. Um, you know, under, under state law, and most states will recognize a value in the property right in the, uh, in the lottery ticket. Uh, you know, there's some states have prosecuted people for stealing winning lottery tickets. I think in this circumstance, it's just a matter of showing, that the, evi showing the evidence that she received this ticket from her boss and that they were supposed to split it. And once she does, I think she has a very good case. I think the judge should set aside half the money to make sure that it isn't spent until he makes his final decision. Yeah, they're essentially asking for an injunction or temporary restraining order so that the money will be frozen right now and that they can work it out. Um, you know, she says there's very little harm to the woman who took off with the 300000 uh, if they freeze that money so they can work this out first. But Mercedes, it's funny because the, the uh, boss, even as this was playing out and the two were sitting there excited over the ticket, he said, you guys aren't going to be friends after this. It's really tricky in these lottery cases. Oh, so prophetic. And by the way, here's our lottery ticket. I oh. have a, in the spirit of our discussion, <laughs> courtesy of Fuzia Fanon, she said she will share her lottery winnings, $450 million, right here between the four of us. I love Which it. Absolutely. Right? Exactly. But oh, it's great. I mean, this, this, this happens all the time with these lottery winnings. And frankly, Ms. Underwood doesn't have any consideration because the big issue here is where's the contract? Where is mm -hmm. either if it's written, a verbal agreement, a verbal contract, where's the consideration? There was not, no money exchanged. Ms. Underwood didn't give any money for those, for those scratch-off tickets. She didn't do anything of value in order to derive a benefit from that contract. And when you look at the cases talking about whether these lottery winnings will be split or not, they look very specifically at the consideration. So even if, let's say, there were dozens and dozens of these tickets and they're scratch off and they're sitting there laboriously going through these tickets that's enough consideration if miss underwood had done that to say well of course she should have part of the winnings mm. but there's nothing that's there's no money there's no sort of labor that she expended in order to derive a benefit a lot well, of these cases really fall on whether there's a contract, well, there isn't one here. And I, I, think and I looked I think in, I'm sorry, just real quick, Nick, I looked under yeah. uh, Arkansas law. I'm not a member of the bar there, so I had to look this up. But they do recognize verbal contracts. And one of the issues that uh, the, the suing the plaintiff is going to have to work through here is that the woman who took off with the ticket is the only one who signed the back of that ticket and went and collected the money. But I think the issue is um, ownership. And it comes down to it was a gift given to them by their boss. So I don't think the analysis of what kind of consideration did she contribute to earn half the money or half the value of the winning ticket. She already owned half of it before it was even um, scratched off. It was given to them as a gift and therefore they should they should share the winnings. And I think the law is pretty clear on that. If you own half of something, someone can not take that f the value of that away from you. And, and we're not time, Merce but Mercedes, I want sure. to ask you really quickly, do you think the judge will at least freeze these uh, assets for now? Uh, certainly, because there, uh, well, already we see that she's already left, and there isn't any any sort of there isn't any follow up as to where she is. They're trying to contact her, and because it can be spent pretty quickly, the injunction is probably the way to secure okay. that money. All right. Well, we're all going to win the four hundred fifty million dollars this weekend. So, Nick and Mercedes, I will see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Have you. a great night. You too. All right. Bomb cyclone has dropped temps well below zero in parts of the country, but some other folks are trying to make the best of this deep freeze. That's next. Chances are you've heard about the bomb cyclone by now. The record-breaking cold air and gusty winds have dropped temperatures into the negatives in a lot of parts of the country. But that is not stopping some folks from having a lot of fun. Check out this video showing Massachusetts residents snowmobiling and skokiting. One man even playing fetch with his dog and a snowball. We love dogs. Most watched, most trusted, most grateful you spent the evening with us. Have a great weekend. Good night from Washington. I'm Shannon Bream.